Hello, this is Sheila Bender, and you are listening to In Conversation, discussions on writing and the writing life. Today, I'm talking with Port Townsend resident and entrepreneur, Ren Ferris. Ren Ferris is the founder of Port Townsend-based Soak on the Sound, the only saltwater bathhouse on the Olympic Peninsula. Creating Soak on the Sound was an ideal project for her, wedding her love of water with a passion for inspiring others toward a practice of self-care. She sees the saltwater soaking, saunas, and massage offered at Soak as an accessible, affordable way to incorporate wellness regimes into daily life. Ren has a master's degree in creative writing and has worked in nonprofit and business development and marketing, along with working with women to help them start or grow their dream businesses. Welcome to our program, Ren. Thank you. So good to be here with you, Sheila. I'm glad you're here with us, too. I can hear that you're taking some time out from a conference you've been attending, and I really appreciate your ability to have this appointment with us to hear from you about your memoir called, of course, Soak, with a subtitle, An Homage to Water. So it's very interesting to me to be talking to you about the writing of your memoir and about Soak. What was your motivation for writing your memoir? Owning a business, you get asked a lot, why did you do this? And so I felt like I wanted to answer that in a more poetic way than just talking about my car accidents and my passion for my own healing and bringing healing to others. So I really just wrote some of the stories that happened along the 10-year path of, of my own healing and just as a poetic response to that question, why did you start the bathhouse? And how long did you work on the memoir? Really, it was a very fast project for me. It was a start to finish in three months was my goal. I didn't quite make it that way because the editing and publishing process ends up taking a lot longer than you would think. Of course. But literally, I went on a retreat, and last winter I took myself on a month-long retreat and just put myself up in a casita way up in the mountains in New Mexico, which a lot of the book takes place in New Mexico because that's where I was at that time. And I put myself up in a cabin, and I just gave myself about five weeks to dream into this project, and most of it got written in that time. I'm impressed. I'm going to ask you a question as a writer. Had you been writing before this, or was this maybe all stored up and waiting to pour out of you? One of my favorite professors in college, he used to say, if you just write every single day, you'll never stop being a writer. And I remember that hitting home so deeply for me. And so I've really made a practice of writing daily, even if it's a few sentences or 10-minute journal writes. I really love to write. And even if it's just capturing the weather or a few potent things that happen during the day. So I really keep myself fluid. So if I sit down to do a project or an essay or a sketch or a vignette for some project, it all feels like the gears are already oiled. Yes. Well, so that was advice well taken, and you sound very disciplined about adhering to it. I'm impressed and a little jealous because although I write every day, I have to say a lot of it ends up being emails. But it is definitely true that the more you practice just keeping writing, the more that part of yourself is present and you don't have to dig around for it. I'm interested in your writing teacher, who that was, and your history with studying writing. Yeah, I had a unique education. I went to Prescott College, which is a very small liberal arts school in northern Arizona, and I did a double major in creative writing and environmental studies. At that time, the words environmental writing or nature writing were kind of new to the field. I ended up following that up with a graduate degree in environmental writing, the only school in the country offering that kind of dual major was the University of Montana at Missoula. So I did that. And it was very special. I got to study with David James Duncan, who wrote The River Y, and he was very much an idol for me. And the Brothers K he wrote, and my story is told by water. He's an environmental writer. And I got to study with Kim Stafford briefly and some other prominent Western kind of nature writing people who were really deep in describing landscapes as well as developing the poetic voice. It was sweet. That's good. And having read your book, I know there's a lot of very personal vignettes in here. And do you feel that that training helped you be able to access that part as well as the part about water? 
I don't know. I, I think the best part about graduate school was that you had to write a book-length manuscript in order to get your master's thesis done, and that was an awesome thing. 130 pages, I think, was the minimum for a thesis, and to just be kind of forced to write and complete a book-length manuscript was a huge discipline and really made a person see that they could do that. And so that was very valuable. What was that book about? That project I would still love to pick up someday. Because it was environmental writing, you had to sort of have a topic that was related to the environment. And at at that time, I was very interested in fertility. So it was a research-driven book that looked at animals and cultures throughout time, and it looked at the relationship between fertility and the state of the environment. So the concept was, do animals and people throughout time have a natural, like, genetic response to environmental circumstances? Meaning, are we more fertile when there's more food and more availability for life on the planet? And are we less fertile, animals, people, cultures, when resources are scarce and times are tough. And it was an absolutely riveting project that I am still very connected to. Did you have some findings that you feel certain about, even though the project's not finished? Absolutely. And do you want to reveal any of those? A couple of really fascinating ones. Herons and egrets, that kind of bird, they'll lay two to three eggs. And then they'll wait, and they'll see. And if conditions are favorable, they will hatch all of those eggs. Um, Hawks do this as well. And if conditions become unfavorable during the tenure of the eggs, they will actually kick one of those eggs out of the nest. They will choose to not have as many offspring, or none at all in some cases, if the environmental conditions are not conducive to life at that time. Also, rats and other types of rodents do the same thing. If the conditions become disfavorable while they're pregnant, they actually reabsorb those embryos and do not bear those offspring. In a world of choice and women's choices, I found it interesting that animals in the natural world, we can see them utilizing a power of choice, actually, Mm -hmm. related to is the environment conducive for life. And I just found that absolutely fascinating. I do, too. And I hope you do pick that project up soon. It sounds very, very timely (laughs) and interesting. And speaking of picking up projects, I I do want to ask you about your project with publishing your memoir, Soak, an homage to water. Tell me about how you did this. So you went for five weeks and you managed to write most of the book, but you still had, you said, the production of the book ahead of you, first the editing and then the production. So how did you go about that? Did you need help? Did you do it yourself? I love help. I always have a mentor and a coach, no matter what I'm doing in life. I always like to look at someone who's a little further down the path than I am and utilize them as coach and guide. Certainly writing a book takes a team between editors and then the book formatters, just the photography, the layout of the cover, the people that know how to really produce a book is a team of people. One of the beautiful things that happened, I was in the airport on the way to that retreat in New Mexico. The retreat had multiple purposes. I wasn't totally sure what all was going to happen in that time. And I was like scrolling through Facebook because I was in a layover and this ad popped up on the screen and it said, The book that will most change your business and your life is the one that you write. And I thought, I've never seen an advertisement for writing on Facebook. And here I am about to get on a plane to go on this writing retreat to New Mexico and to write a book about my business. So that ad was like speaking directly to me. And it ended up being an ad for a coach. And this coach lives on the East Coast and he helps women entrepreneurs. He has a very specific target audience. He helps women entrepreneurs write their book to grow the awareness of their business and their projects. I got on the phone with him like two days later and just really resonated with him. And he did guide me all the way through the project. And that was very helpful. And really, I would not have expected that to have happened. It was like a total gift. I think that when you're writing, when you're absorbed in a project, and in your case, about to be absorbed in it, there's a large amount of synchronicity in our lives that maybe doesn't occur exactly when we're not paying attention in the way we are when we know that we're invested in doing our writing. So that's a fabulous story. Then what happened? He coached you through the writing of the book and the process. And then what was next in terms of the team you needed? Really, it wasn't anything else until the very end when you had 
the editor and then the production team that really take the writing and make it into a manuscript that is book worthy. So did you put this team together? Did your coach happen to know these people? I think a lot of people are interested in what we call self-publishing, but a lot of self-publishing is not done by oneself. And I think that's an important thing for writers to know just how important it is to have professionals guiding you through the process of book production. Again, back to your comment about synchronicity, you know, it's really just about finding the right people seeing an ad or I use a website called Upwork a lot where you can type in, I'm looking for someone to help me do this or that about my book. And you can find all these freelancers all across the world. My publisher, the woman who helped me with that was in France and she was just awesome. And I will definitely work with her again. Never would have met her if I hadn't just kind of found her along the way. But I absolutely agree. I wanted to see the projects that people had done before. I wanted to feel a resonance. I wanted people to feel connected to my project. And I found that team and it was all women and they were just fantastic. And it was a a real joy. And I look forward to working with them again. And the end result, the book is very beautiful. It's beautifully laid out and the cover is gorgeous and you get to really feel like you're soaking in your experience. So your intuitions paid off. It sounds like you wanted to feel resonance and trust you were both going with your own intuition and then with your research about these people and what they had already produced. So that part of your process took longer than five weeks. Absolutely. That's the funny part. You know, we think, okay, we're done. We wrote the book. Now it'll be out there for the public. And then we have a longer time to wait to get it into the condition that the public needs it in in order to appreciate it. You've told us a little bit about how quickly you wrote, but did you face some obstacles in the writing or was it really just ready to be written so you enjoyed those five weeks of writing? Well, there are always obstacles in writing. I I can't imagine anyone would say there isn't. Every single day, what goes in, what stays out. I had imagined this book as being very long. It had a different name. I had been imagining it for about five years and I'm an avid journal writer as I was telling you, and all through my healing journey, which was 10 years, but really long, I kept really intensive journals. And I imagined writing a book called A Journal of Return, where it really wove the stories in with the journal entries and was just a very, very big, long book. Working with the coach, he really had me write a different book and a very easily accessible book. So... It was hard to let go of what my original vision was and make that change. And also sometimes difficult to stay disciplined, especially toward the end. You are listening to KPTZ 91.9 FM, Port Townsend. In case you just joined us, you are listening to In Conversation with Sheila Bender, discussions on writing and the writing life. Sheila is talking with Port Townsend resident Ren Farris about her memoir about the healing power of water. What allowed you to finally let go and trust his judgment about the book? It really book? made sense to me that if you are writing a book to grow your business, but to kind of show the underbelly of your business, answer the why, that it does need to be a very accessible book, that our attention span in this culture, unfortunately, is getting less and less, and that if someone could pick up and read, like, a chapter in five minutes and read the whole book in an hour if they wanted to, that there was really a benefit to that as a really accessible piece to go with the business. So it's not a piece of literature. It's just part of the emulation of the business of soap. Oh, I don't know. I'm going to disagree with you a little bit. Um, I think it is also a piece of literature because of your personal experiences in there. And it's not just about the business at all. It's about your motivation, what brought you there, which is all very personal. And I agree with you that we tend to like shorter writing these days. And you said that you studied with Kim Stafford at one point, and he's certainly a master of the short pieces put together into a longer piece, which is, I think, what you've done. So... I do think it's a piece of literature, and I know I resonate with it, and my journey's different than yours, and yet I recognize the journey of a writer, the journey of somebody who wants to make a difference, and in your case, through offering water to other people, soaking water, salt water. just want you to know that. Although it's different than what you intended, I think it's not just about business, although it certainly does serve to answer those questions that people have. 
I believe that nothing is wasted when we're writers. So you have this other manuscript, perhaps, that's longer, envisioned differently than this one. Do you think you might go back to that one, too, in addition to the environmental one, and see what it might become? It definitely might. I have another book project in the works right now that is very, very different, not anything to do with my healing or soak necessarily. And I'm very excited about that project, not really wanting to talk about it quite yet. But yeah, certainly want to keep writing. And we are always writing from our life experience. So I doubt doubt any of that content will really go away. I thought maybe this would be a nice moment to read a little bit. Thank you. That would be great. This is chapter two, a vignette called The Noise Inside. I woke just after dawn, built and lit fires in the two wood stoves, gathered my things, and headed out across the sprawling sage land, down the plateau, to the place where hot lithium waters pour from the earth. As I dropped my body down into the minerally pool, the noise stopped. I didn't realize at first that the noise was even there. It had built up over time and took me a while to actually become aware of it. At first, I would hear the sharp sounds of the actual crash, the crunching of metal and the car roof dragging on asphalt, and it would wake me up at night. Later, every sound became too much. A blender, a hairdryer, music, people's voices. For a whole stretch of months, I barely left the house. My sweetie would leave for work, and I spent day after day after day in complete silence. Even the noise of the first rush of water while running a bath shook my system. I don't think I understood then what was happening. I was enduring, working through, and untangling the noise inside. Over time, it got less dramatic and I could briefly go into public places, ride in cars, and eventually drive, talk on the phone, or listen to soothing music played quietly. It wasn't until I sank down into one of the hot mineral pools one crystalline New Mexico morning and heard the noise inside actually stop that I fully realized that it was there. Ah, wait, what's that? Nothing. Nothing? How long had it been since I heard nothing? No doldrum beating, grief, no buzzing static, fear, no endless ringing, trauma. The water silenced the agony inside, and by giving me the gift of silence, I could see the tremendous dissonant symphony that had been existing in my head. It was a revelation. After that, I made my way the 30 miles down the plateau to the springs to soak at least three mornings a week for most of five years. More healing occurred in those waters than I will ever know. What I do know is that it's not true anymore what the doctors said, that I'll never work again, not be able to carry more than 10 pounds, never live a normal life. Anything I brought to the water, the grief, the rage, the incessant physical pain, the mental exhaustion of staying motivated to get through it, the fatigue of my hope that it would all end, the water took and quelled and quieted every time I emerged renewed, softened, different. I would not have made it through the years it ended up taking to rebuild some semblance of that normal life they were talking about without soaking. Disarming the noise inside was critical, like dismantling a smoking alarm going off in my brain. I still have too much static inside, more than I wish, and it is still to the waters I go to find my own silence inside the womb of water. Thank you. Thank you. That is so inspiring, and the sounds in your writing are so beautiful that I just feel lulled as if I am soaking in your experience. So thank you so much for reading that part. I want to be sure to mention where people can find your book. And I think there are at least two places that I know of. So can you tell us how to find the book and also more information about you and Soak? Oh, yeah. So certainly you can come into Soak on the Sound, uh, downtown Port Townsend, and we have the book there. 
also online at Amazon.com and at the Writers' Workshop. They have some copies of it over there as well. Which is also in Port Townsend on Water Street. Which is also in Port Townsend. And any information about the book or where to buy it or about Soak on the Sound in general, saltwater soaking, if the concept sounds new to you, um, soakonthesound.com is our website. Well, thank you. I just always want to be sure that we tell the listening audience how they can find out more. I sort of run out of questions. You've been so thorough in telling us about your experience of writing the book and a little bit about the project you'd like to pick up and the fact that you have one that you're not ready to talk about, which is definitely the writer's prerogative. Hemingway warned us against talking away our stories. So I really admire you for being able to tell us there is one, but you're not ready to talk about it. But is there anything else you'd like us to know about what you think about writing, what your advice might be to people who want to write about a personal experience a journey or a, an establishing of an important organization in their life? Mm, thanks, Sheila. It's a great question. One of the things that people say to me all the time is, how did you find the time? I cannot believe you wrote a book. You run this business by yourself and on and on and on. I have multiple businesses going on simultaneously, actually. And the one thing I would say is anyone can make time to write. Anyone can make time for anything that's important to them in their life. But certainly writers know how important writing is to them. And I think one of the things we can say is that we're too busy. And I just don't believe that. So one of the ways that I got the book finished once I came home from my writing retreat and really way back into the saddle of my life in Port Townsend running my business was that I just decided to wake up 45 minutes earlier every day. And I know that sounds easy and sometimes it's is not. (laughs) But it was really a way to commit to the project. And I told my partner, you know, I want you to stay asleep and don't get up and let me get up, make my tea, and I'm going to be an hour upstairs. And that is my time to get this project finished. And uh, without that time, the project wouldn't have gotten done. And it really showed me that just with something as simple as 45 minutes a day, you can really birth something beautiful. That's fantastic advice. And it also occurs to me, just by having somebody to tell, you said, don't get up, I'm going to be writing, just making that commitment verbally out loud to another person can actually help us keep it. I know that Mm -hmm. when I have something that I'm afraid I'm going to not keep in terms of writing time. I will start telling my writing group. I'll start telling other writers. I'll tell my family. And I'm the kind of person who does not want to go back on my word. So (laughs) I make myself have to keep my word to myself. And the quiet of morning can be a really lovely time to write, as is, for some people, the quiet of late at night. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there is something about when other people aren't using the airwaves so much mm-hmm. that still oh, us. Time. Yeah. So, again, is there anything else you'd like to say before we close our conversation? Well, I'd love to read uh, just the closing piece of the book. Would you like me to do that now? I would or love say it. Another? That's okay, perfect. Awesome. Coda. These days, I am having an affair with soak. I wake before the rest of town, unlock the big, knotty alder door with the seahorse door handle, enter the dark bathhouse, and undress. I fire up the sauna, slip into a tub, walk around naked in the lobby. Or I come in late at night and hose everything down, open everything up, play loud music, dance freely. I come in tired and in tears. I sit on the floor and pray. I ask the spirit of Soak for her help, and I feed her with flowers, incense, the smoke of cedar, a bowl of water with fresh petals floating, bells. And I come in when no one is around and play my cedar flute, ancient melodies filling every corner, blessing the waters, resonating and echoing and building beauty into the walls and architecture tending the wild heart of the space itself. For all that Soak gives to others, for all she holds, for the medicine that this project is for me, I give back to her in these simple, sensuous ways, clandestine lovemaking, the affair of my heart. Mm, Thank you. Thank you, Ren. Before we part today, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about your background. So today's story started that you told us you were in New Mexico, and then you had gone back to New Mexico to write for five weeks, and that at the moment you're at a conference, which I believe is in Florida. And where did you grow up? 
I grew up in rural Massachusetts, and then we moved to Southern California when I was a teenager, so kind of both coasts. And then you went to school in Montana, so, and that drew you because of the program, right? At some point, and Montana is not a coastal state, so did you find water in Montana? There are some incredible hot springs about an hour south of Missoula, these really wild hot springs on the Loxaw River, and I would go there as much as I could. <laughs> <laughs> so, and when you were growing up in Southern California, were you a water baby? Oh, yeah, definitely swimming. We would go to the ocean every day before school. All my friends were surfers, and we were kind of the babes on the beach, and they were the surfers. But it was really, uh, for me, always just to be at the water every single day. I can't remember a day we weren't in, in the ocean. So I think I read that you were 12 when you moved to California. Yeah. So the first 12 years of your life were coastal Massachusetts or inland yeah, rural Massachusetts. We had a big pond in our yard, and I just loved living really rural in the woods. So it's just delightful to me to learn about your journey geographically. So what eventually brought you to Port Townsend? The water. <laughs> 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 to, live, to live in such a beautiful, progressive, community-oriented town, fully surrounded by water, I pretty much felt like It was a dream, a dream place for me. And when the vision became very clear that I was going to open a bathhouse, I just couldn't think of a better place to do it. So you had visited Port Townsend at some point. I had originally come to um, Madrona, my body, to study Nia Ah. as part of my healing journey, actually. I know the stories of writers especially has a lot to do with Centrum and what's going on up there at Fort Warden. It draws people with interests that are very akin to the interests of the people in Port Townsend. And then we absorb these wonderful people like you into our town, and we're so lucky. So I appreciate very much that you found us here and opened your passion project of SOAK. And I want to repeat for the listeners one more time your website. So tell us again how to find you online. SOAKonthesound.com, and you can email us. Uh, those emails go right to me and right to my manager and we'd love to talk with you or come on in and say hi and come get in saltwater tub and yeah it's an absolute pleasure all right and that is at the end of town is about as close as you can get to the water before you wouldn't be able to build your facility (laughs) so i i always like walking that part of town because it does feel like you could just step out into the water so thank you so very much ren for this conversation And I look forward to your return to Port Townsend. We'll be talking again soon. Thank you, Sheila. So good. Thank you. In Conversation is produced by Sheila Bender and edited by Charlie Fleischman. 